again, I'm Brian McDermott. I'm your, uh, I'm your facilitator for the day. On the panel today, we have Brittany Beard and we have Don Moffitt and Ben Sandell. And all of us are consultants and, and collaborators with, commun- with Columinate, which you probably know is a co-op of co-op consultants. Behind the scenes, we've got Joel Brock, who's managing the technology for us. So if at some point you hear me desperately calling out for help, it's going to be to Joel to sort of put us on track. This is all pretty, um, pretty new for some of us. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm not going to spend um, too much on extended introductions, but I'm going to tell you that all of us who are participating from Columinate today, we've worked extensively and for many years with cops all over the country. Um, and I will say particularly that Brittany and Don and Ben have a ton of experience working with the financial aspects of operating co-ops. Um, that said, none of us are suggesting that we can predict what the future looks like after this pandemic. Um, none of us are saying that we have all the right answers about how to manage the finances to get through this challenge. But I will tell you that Brittany and Don and Ben have a long history of working with these very specific kinds of questions and testing and implementing solutions. And and a big chunk of where their focus is right now is on these kinds of uh, challenges. The plan for today, so you know what you've gotten yourself into, is to see if we can just begin to help you think a little bit innovatively, a little bit differently, specifically about finances, about how to get through this and come out strong on the other side. Um, the process is Don and, and Ben and Brittany are going to take about five minutes apiece. Their assignment was tough. I, I, we, we asked them to see if they could identify a few important things they could share with you to begin um, provoking your thinking a little bit. Basically, the challenge was if you could tell people only two or three things that you thought would be most helpful to stimulate their thinking about dealing with the situation, what would you share? So they're each going to take about five minutes. Um, when they're done, we're going to assign you to random breakout rooms, um, and you're going to have a total of 15 minutes in the breakout rooms. And so what we want you to do is take you know, a short time to introduce yourselves you know, very quickly. Um, and then what we want you to do is to talk about three different questions. What are the most important things you will have heard from Don and Ben and Brittany what has potential applications in your co-ops? And then, and then perhaps most important is what questions do you have for Donna, Brittany, and, and Ben that we can answer when we come back out of those breakouts? When we send you off, again, you'll be assigned randomly. We'll post the questions there so you have those as a reminder. And we're going to ask you to type. If somebody would volunteer to type your responses in the chat box. And it would be really helpful because what we're going to do is, is capture all of your chat comments and put them into a summary that we'll post after this, um, after this session. Um, so if you could number when you're doing question one, what are the most important things you heard? At least give us an indication so that we, when we begin to compile those, it'll be a little bit easier for us to um, track where you're at. Um, and then when we come out, we'll take, we'll have hopefully 20 or 25 minutes for you to post, uh, post questions again in the chat box. And we'll, we'll give Ben and Brittany and uh, Don a chance to respond. I, just one last thing I want to do is, is to sort of frame the expectations for what we know and what we're hoping we can get done today. We have an hour. So there's no way we're going to be able to get into great depth on anything. But we're hopeful that we're going to be able to provide some ideas that's, that will help put you on a path to do some of the work that you'll have to do down the line. Obviously, the hard stuff happens after today. Um, but we're hoping you can take away a few things that will set you on to a course that will be helpful. Um, we, you know, we, we're open to the idea that there may be a need for follow-up sessions on this. And all of us also are available after this session to talk further if you want to follow up on any specific situations that you, you may be dealing with. Um, I, and I want to thank you one more time for showing up. This is, this is a pretty new approach for us in terms of trying to provide support um, and information. When we, sat out, when we set out to do this, we didn't know quite what to expect. Um, when we were planning, we got together and we said, okay, so 
we're going to do breakouts. How many people do we need to show up for this to be successful? And we all agreed, hey, if we get eight people, we're good to go. And, you know, if you, I'm looking at the list, we have a hundred people that turned out for today. So um, we're really appreciative and thankful that you uh, chose to hang out with us today. With that, I'm going to turn things over to Brittany. All right. Awesome. Thank you very much, Brian, for that introduction. Um, so as Brian said, uh, I'm also a consultant with Columinate. My area of expertise is working with operational and financial outcomes. I'm happy to see some of my co-op, familiar co-ops here on the call today. So uh, yeah, it is definitely hard to whittle it down to just a couple points. Um, in such an unprecedented time, there's really so much we just don't know about how the shifts in our environment and consumer habits will impact operational and financial plans. Even the best laid plans are built from assumptions about what we believe to be true. And the reality is there's so much we just don't know about what's coming next for our sector. Most co-ops manage their labor to sales budgets on a weekly basis and maybe do a deep dive into their monthly metrics. Because conditions in our communities are changing so rapidly, it's really more important now than ever, and I can't stress this enough, that your co-op has nimble tools to be tracking, not just monthly or weekly labor and sales trends, but maybe even your sales and labor expense day to day. In my view, one of the most important things our co-ops can be doing right now is conserving cash, that cash is our oxygen, meaning preserving our margin minus labor, and positioning ourselves for what comes next. In order to do that, we're gonna to need to make data our friend. And none of us can tell you what is coming next, but we do know that we simply can't wait for things to just bounce back to normal um, and base our future assumptions off the past. So your co-op needs to be collecting data so that you can be your own detective to track how trends are shifting in your communities. So first, let's take a look at an example of some data tracking. So here we see an example of weekly year over year sales comparison. Week 11 and 12 that you see there are the second and third weeks of March when the COVID boom was really hitting. And notice that sales actually begin to slow for this co-op. And when we arrive at week 16, sales actually begin to drop behind the results from last year. So set your co-op up with a chart so that you can really be watching these trends. We're trying to find that trend line and you're going to need strong data and good visuals to be able to do that. Next, we see the same co-op here tracking their labor to sales ratios on a trend line. Now, this co-op has been performing way below their previously established labor budgets. Even as we check out week 16, where sales performance lagged behind last year, the labor as a percentage of sales still remains low. So your co-ops are really being forced into efficiency and it's not painless, right? It can feel pretty painful right now. Um, but there are lessons to learn about how clean and how lean we can be operating for optimum efficiency. If our co-ops can revolutionize the way that we're approaching labor efficiency and learn those lessons now, maybe there's the possibility that we can set our operations up to be more profitable in the emerging future, whatever that ends up looking like. And next, let's take a look at um, an example of a co-op's customer count and average basket size over the last few weeks. So at week 11, in that top chart here, we see for this co-op that their weekly customer count has taken an absolute nosedive. So they went from about 6,000 unique transactions um, down to an average about 2,000 per week. And at that same mark, about week 11, we see that their basket size begins to sharply rise. And I mean sharply, right? They've nearly tripled their basket size going from $25 to about $70. So the questions that everybody wants to know the answers to, like how do we know when to open back up our prepared foods department? How do we know when to re-extend our regular operating hours or maybe open up a day of the week that you've been closed? Well, as basket size falls and customer count rises, it means that people are coming in more often and for smaller shops. You really need to be watching your own trends. If big basket is the normal, the new normal, then the loyalty of a single shopper 
they become twice or maybe three times as valuable in this case. So it's possible that that might show up in our strategic marketing planning. Watching this customer habit data is really, really revealing to what's happening now and what could potentially be coming next. And then lastly, here's an example of a co-op that's doing daily sales tracking for posterity. So in this file, and there's a lot of data here, but I just want to see a few to see the extent at which people are taking a deep dive to get a sense of what is happening. This co-op's tracking how shifts in their operation have impacted day to day. So they're trying to make sense of trends. Should they still staff on Sunday as if it's the biggest sales day of the week? Did shortening hours last week kill their sales? Did their sales slump because they missed a UNFI order or because of something else? So when we build out our data tracking tools, we actually are building ourselves resources to use in database decision-making. Being able to identify and anticipate trends is gonna give your co-op the advantage when it comes to financial stability and ultimately long-term security. So the key here is to stay informed, to, to watch your data, and then be ready to pivot with that data when it comes to making operational changes or adjustments as we continue to move forward into the future. So I'm going to go ahead. That's my five minutes. We'll have some time to answer some more questions, as Brian said. And I'm going to pass the book over to my colleague, Don Moffat, to talk a little bit about financial planning. Thanks, Brittany. <clears throat> Thanks a lot. Now, the reason that we spend time budgeting, you know, throughout the what, normal operations is to ensure that we're operating sustainably. And like everything else right now, budgeting is more challenging than ever. There's no normal. So it's also more important than ever. There are things we know that aren't gonna change. So we have to allow for them. We have to be, make sure that we can cover those obligations. And that includes for all, virtually all of us, the debt obligations that we have. And for most of us, the lease obligations that we have. There's also things that we know are changing and changing fairly significantly and that's uh, sales and personnel expense. And depending on the level that you want to budget at, Brittany was touching on some, like how some of those things are changing, like transaction size, but then you can look at the store level. There are also things that for a lot of us, it's probably is changing. Um, and one of the things that uh, there is like prepared foods, gross margins, because the mix is different than it was before. So what do you do with that? Well, one of the things that you have to do is to revise and revise and revise, and you have to use variable assumptions, and you have to keep asking what if. So when you do your budget, you know, you're going to have a budget and you're going to have a sales figure that you think makes sense for uh, two weeks from now or six weeks from now, but you also have to be able to say, well, what if it's 20% less? What if it's 20% more? And you're going to look at personnel as a percentage of sales and say, what if I'm 10% more and how am I going to cover that? And so keep asking the what ifs, work on building the model where you can put in variables and see what the different results are. And we'll talk more about this um, after you get a chance to talk among yourselves. So um, I'm going to pass. I'm not a five minute kind of guy. It's more like a three minute kind of guy. And I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Ben Sandell, who's going to talk a little bit about what that means, what that means going forward. And I, of course, have to unmute myself. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Brittany. Thanks, everybody. Um, OK, now am I unmuted? Okay, good. 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 Sorry good. about that. Uh, thanks, everybody. And thanks, Don and Brittany. I'm going to kind of approach this a little differently in that I don't really have a lot of data for you. But uh, I work with many co-ops on raising capital from owners, uh, usually to do some form of major project or reinvestment, um, new stores, or in some cases, new co-ops opening from scratch startups. Um, additional stores, renovations, whatever it might be, uh, helping co-ops raise money from their owners. And I'm going to look at this aspect right now in two ways. One is, do you think it's possible to raise money from the owners at this time? And should we actually be considering reinvestment? Because as, uh, as Brittany said, 
Cash is our oxygen. We need to make sure we have adequate cash. Is this the time to be spending money on our stores? So first, let's talk about whether it's possible. Uh, I believe it is possible quite a bit uh, or uh, uh, quite possible to raise money from owners. The process is changing. You know, we can't, we don't have the ability to do in-person events. Um, that is a, has been a mainstay of raising money from owners. And yet we are seeing co-ops right now raising money without ever shaking anybody's hand or being in person with them. So it, it can definitely be done. Another aspect of this is, do we think that there are still people who have money out there? Um, and the answer to that is absolutely yes. So, uh, of course, there is uh, some volatility in the stock market. Uh, people are seeing some investments change. And yet, uh, I've always seen with co-op capital campaigns that there are people, often people we don't realize have the means in our communities. There are people out there who have money and who want to put it into something that does good for their community, for the world, and our co-ops certainly are great and very attractive investment opportunities for them. Um, but the second thing is, should we consider it? Should we, you know, why might now be a good time? And there's a, a number of reasons why I think it is worth considering. And of course, I wanna say up front, um, I am not advocating doing anything without doing your due diligence first, without uh, exploring to make sure that there is a cost benefit to it. Um, but let's think about why it might be great to reinvest in our co-ops right now. From a practical perspective, there may very well be deals available. You have probably local contractors and craftspeople who need work and are ready to work and would love to work for the co-op at a reasonable rate. There may be bargains on real estate or equipment or uh, other assets that can be acquired right now out of bankruptcies or uh, just because of the, the, uh, the very unstable times that may offer you some good deals out there. Um, from a competitive standpoint, shouldn't we always be thinking about reinvesting? Um, always about how we make our store the best they can be. Um, and from a cooperative standpoint, since we exist to serve our cooperative owners and our communities, we're always looking for what can we do to serve those folks better? Um, how can we increase the value of our co-ops uh, for people in their lives? Um, now is a great time to be thinking about that. Things are changing, so we want to be thinking about what might a new vision for our hot bar be? You know, how might we be handling uh, curbside um, and online ordering even after the pandemic? Because I believe some of the changes that we're seeing during the pandemic, they will stay with us. So it might be a great time to consider updating your IT and your point of sales system. Um, get creative, think about it. We always wanna serve our owners better. Um, and you know, we're also, I guess the, the, my final piece of this is that um, whether we like it or not, we're seeing societal changes going on. This, these are gonna be big and impactful changes. And I think some of the challenges and inequities of our conventional of our uh, of conventional business is being laid bare for all to see some of the corruption and unpleasantness. Um, as co-ops, we do better, and we can be the example for how to do better for many others, for other businesses, for people. We can really chart a course for change and show others how to change too, uh, but change usually takes reinvestment. So uh, that is my, um, those are my five minutes. Um, maybe I'll even borrow a couple seconds from Don, uh, but just to say that it is possible, although the process is different, to raise money from owners these days. Um, there are many still good people out there who want to do amazing things with their money uh, and might not want to be putting their money into the stock market or banks. Um, and that it's always a great time, if it makes sense, uh, it's always a great time to reinvest in our co-ops, to make them the best they can be, to serve people the best they can be, and to be the example for the rest of the world and the rest of business as to how we can do things better. Thanks.
Awesome. Hey, thank you, Brittany, Don, and Ben. So a lot of information came at you very quickly. We're going we're gonna to randomly assign you to a breakout room to give you a little time to digest this a bit. So again, you're going to end up in a room with four or five people. Some of us panelists and may end up in there, but we're going to pull out. So if you see us dropping in and disappearing, it's deliberate. We want to leave you that time to be with your colleagues. Um, the questions are on the slide there. And, and again, I'm asking if somebody would be willing to take notes in the chat box so that we can build that into the summary um, when, we, when we process at the end of this meeting. All right, I think we're ready to send folks off into their rooms. I'll just give you a heads up that when we get done, we're gonna send out a link to the video and to the summary, but there'll also be a survey that will follow up. And we know that a few people at least had problems with unmuting in the rooms. So, you know, any feedback you can provide that will help us going forward to be great about the process, the content or whatever, but even about the technology. So, um, all right, I, it looks like um, we're maybe back to what we should expect at this point. I think, so we're gonna go. So I'm already seeing questions pop into the, uh, into the chat box. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Panel team, help me if, you, if you're seeing questions here. I'm going to flow through and see if I can get, I'm going to go back to the top of the list. The first one I see is, um, what is the best way to plan in this environment? That one's kind of wide open, but Brittany, Don, Ben, you have a thought on that? Well, this is Don. It kind of depends on the level that you're planning at, right? If you're talking about how do we, um, but for a financial plan, the best way to plan is with a lot of options. That is to say, with to say, okay, I'm going to plan for sales at this level, um, a hundred thousand a week, but I also need to plan for twenty percent less and twenty percent more. And uh, I'm going to plan that. Where and I think that uh, Brittany had a, a brilliant. Um, observation, which is as you're watching your transactions and um, basket size, as those start to move back to where they used to be, you'll know that you're moving back towards something that looks like more like normal was than like today. So that'll help you with your planning as well. Well, Don, I know when we were doing our planning, you made, a, you made an observation that it's really important that people do the planning even in the midst of the crisis, all the other things they're dealing with, but you can't set aside the, the importance of actually doing that kind of contingency thinking now, correct? Uh, that's absolutely right. You know, in the first, in the first week, the first weeks, um, I suspect most general managers were on the front lines and, uh, and that's completely understandable. But now they've got to find a way to be able to spend the time to be starting to look at projections going forward and making sure that they preserve enough capital that um, they continue to be able to uh, cover all the obligations that Great. the co-op's going to have. And that leads into the next question that's in the list is, and maybe Brittany, this is really in response to your presentation, what's the right balance between preserving cash and improving the balance sheet? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I would say, you know, sort of to echo Don's sentiment is we're, we're doing multiple scenario planning. We're also, you know, whereas in a typical scenario, you might sit down and write a budget for the whole year and then just kind of sit back and watch. Budgeting is now, uh, at least until there are some really clear trends and conditions we can rely on, budgeting is going to be a really active practice. So step one is to make sure um, through all of this sort of tracking mediums that we looked at, that you are not burning cash, meaning it is not requiring cash to subsidize the daily operation of your business. That is step one, to be managing within your parameters to make sure you're not uh, losing cash that is not part of your plan. Now, the concepts that Don and Ben was talking about are thinking of what sort of cash and capital uh, investments are going to produce growth in what you see as an emerging need for your co-ops. And 
I think some of us, maybe there's some inkling about what that might be, right? Ben mentioned reinvesting into online shopping infrastructure, um, looking at, you know, revamping some of your uh, high touch, high frequency self-serve areas, maybe in prepared foods, whatever it is, there's some things that are clearly beginning to emerge, um, but making sure you're not burning cash from the operation and thinking of capital expenditures that uh, your trends indicate will be a good investment. So there's this idea of being ready to pivot into whatever comes next. This question kind of piggybacks on us, and I think it's it, it's related to what Ben was sharing. Doug Johnson for his group is saying, how do you balance the need to retain cash with the need to reinvest? Ben, you want to take a shot at that? Or Brittany, do you want to, I mean... Go ahead, Ben. Yeah. Um, you know, you have to balance that very carefully, um, looking at your store's history, your current operational performance, um, and make a plan. So it certainly doesn't make sense to do anything without a plan, but I think it uh, is worth looking at what are the areas we could improve. You know, maybe uh, I think... For GMs, you're probably already thinking about this and prioritizing what's going to be the best bang for our buck. There could be a long-term, there could be a long, medium, and near-term things that you want to invest in. What's going to get you uh, either a competitive advantage or a service advantage now uh, and look at what's that going to cost and do we have the means? Can we raise the means? Can we uh, shoulder the burden of that debt or additional equity? You know, what what makes sense for us. And it's going to be different, I think, for every co-op. Certainly, we can help. We can talk to you and, and help assess some of that. Um, but that's how I would look at that balance between retained cash and, and reinvestment. And I would add to that that, um, you know, the, the answer to every question is it depends, right? And it depends on what your needs are. You need to have enough cash. You've got some cushion to carry you forward because you can project well, we know there's so many things that are in flux right now that we're not going to be able to project accurately. So you've got to have that cushion to make sure that you can cover your obligations. But then you're looking at, well, what are my needs to reinvest? And if you're thinking, well, it'd be great to have uh, Ben mention a new POS system. And you have to look at that and go, okay, what's the level of like, what kind of condition is my current system in? Right. And if you're, if you can make it go a little bit longer then you might wait a little bit longer. But if you're walking past a, a, a counter example might be you're walking past your salad bar every day. It's sitting there dark and empty. And you might start thinking, how long is it going to be before a customer is going to touch a pair of tongs? That's something I really need to invest in. So you, because you want to turn that area into something that you can actually get sales out of and start um, uh, contributing back to the store's uh, financial uh, position. So you're looking at, you're, you're constantly looking at both what are my needs for retaining cash and how, um, how, how what's, that, what's the level of demand I have on the cash for reinvestment? I've got a couple of questions that I think are related and I'll read them both and then you guys can see what you think. One is, how do you make smart capital investments when the market is in flux? Doug Johnson provided that one. And then from Lorraine Sorensen, it's related. It's, do you agree that if it is an appropriate time for a co-op to raise capital, this is a good time to court individual investors who are looking for a place to put cash? The securities markets are bewildering right now, so investing in one's co-op looks less risky relative to other investments. That's that's a lot. That's big questions. But do you guys want to take a shot at that? I have a thought that I can ahead, jump Brent. in with, which is, I think, Don, I just wrote it down because it's such a good point that the focus, like when you're prioritizing what capital investments to make, is capital investments that are going to contribute to your financial performance in what you see as the short term future. So, you know, maybe now is not the right time to redo the asphalt in the parking lot as a capital investment, but it might That's be good. the right time to think about really investing in online shopping infrastructure, whatever you need to do to feel like you're best positioned for the shifts that you begin to see emerging in your community. So there is sort of a scale of prioritization there. Um, and the other thing I would say, uh, back to some of the operational tracking concepts that I talked about earlier to Laurie, uh, Laureen's 
point about is the COP a good investment now? I would say yes, but we do have a due diligence to our members and our investors to make sure that we are uh, operationally and financially sustainable. So there's like setting the framework for sustainability, making sure that your operation in place is not burning cash um, or producing a negative net that's not part of your plan. And then there's a step for, you know, some of the concepts Ben was talking about where you're actually going out with a plan, uh, not just to bail you out, so to speak, but to increase your financial viability going forward. And, and I would add that I think it is a great time to talk to individual investors about your co-op. Um, of course, we can't say that our co-ops are any better or worse risk than the stock market, but certainly they are more uh, local, more immediate, easier to grasp. Um, and I think those are all attractive things at the moment. Um, and there are certainly uh wealthy individuals, people with the means who are looking for something they can do with their money uh, that may potentially give them a better return, but also just make them, you know, I, I think of it as the 2 a.m. test. When you're lying awake at 2 a.m. wondering what is happening with your money, uh, you know, when it's helping keep it when it's helping grow your your local food store that employs local people and sells local products you know that's a pretty good feeling to have at two in the morning and that is a major reason why many people invest in what they invest in so yes it's a great time to talk to people about investing in your co-ops so that there's a question from martha wales that relates to that and then and then there's another question that i'll tag on to the back so let me give you both um martha was saying in the group they talked about timing of asking members to invest and how the daily sales information is useful, but they're also wondering, how do you go forward with that particular information? And then I want to tie back because I think Brittany already addressed this a little bit and when she mentioned you, you have to have a sort of a hierarchy of needs kinds of things. But Robin Des Hotel, Des Hotel I'm probably not pronouncing that correct, was saying, is there a point in doing a two or three year plan um, considering what's going on. So timing and how do you move forward with this kind of solicitation or uh, engagement? And can you think three years out? So Brian, this is Don. Um, I wanted to add on to what Ben was saying and it sort of ties the timing of asking members. Great. And, and that is, is that when, um, when Durham co-op market was in the process of developing, uh, this, the great recession hit. And, um, and actually it turned out to be, it, it slowed us down by a couple of years, but it turned out to be a really good thing because construction slowed, it cooled way down. Uh, building materials became a much more affordable. Contractors were more competitive in their bidding and it actually all worked to our advantage. So uh, in terms of, and, and so that goes, um, that, I'm sorry, <laughs> I, I'm answering two different questions in my head at the same time. That was the, que that was the, the uh, issue about capital investments in a changing time. Yep. Um, what Ben was talking about was talking about the, the co-op as an investment. And when Durham Co-op was in that great recession and people looked at the markets and they said, I don't, I don't want to be part of this game, right? Because it didn't align with their mission, their personal values. And co-ops do. Well, um, and that, that the things that aren't changing is that what our mission is, what our purpose is and our sense of community and the people's values who are, have always been the mainstay of our uh, community investors. Awesome. Brittany or Ben, and, any other thoughts on that? Well, to, regarding the two to three year plan, I'm not sure whether that's, you know, in contrast to a one year plan or in contrast to a 10 year plan, but I think it's always worth doing fairly long-term future plans. And I think one of the one of the ways we can use that right now, if you say have a three-year plan, you can have a couple different scenarios in those plans and then watch for the next three or six months to see which scenario does it appear we're going towards and then craft your direction accordingly. Um, you might even also... Uh, and, and there was someone I noticed who asked, like, what should a board be thinking about? Well, along with that, 
creating that long-term plan, thinking about, all right, well, what, you know, start educating yourselves uh, at the board level, reading up on what are trends in the grocery industry, what are trends in retail, what are other co-ops doing, how is your co-op doing so that if opportunities should arise, you're going to be able to make good decisions more quickly. And as an example, I will just point out uh, in Traverse City, Michigan, Oriana Co-op, which has been thinking and planning around, let's do something great for a long time. Uh, Lucky's opened a new store in their community a couple years ago, declared bankruptcy this past fall. They were able to purchase that store, turnkey operation. Uh, I think they were maybe closed for 24 or 48 hours. So it went from operating store to operating co-op at an amazing price, which they were able to do because they'd been planning, researching, uh, saving money, um, putting the pieces together, even without knowing exactly what their project was going to be. Opportunity knocked, they were able to to go for it. So yes, I think making long-term plans is a great thing to be doing. And and there was a question, um, Ben, about specifically our, our expansions moving forward. And I know in our planning, you were saying you've seen evidence that lots of other stuff it, is happening. It certainly varies. You know, there is uh, there are a lot of factors and it varies from community to community. But yes, I'm seeing um, new stores are currently getting built out. Um, my own local co-op is uh, about to, they've raised all the money. They just in the last couple of days signed the first position financing. They raised also a million dollars from owners uh, and they're, the, they're going to be, you know, uh, setting shovels into the, well, actually it's more like they're going to be tearing down existing walls any day in starting their expansion. Uh, Green Star Co-op just opened a gorgeous brand new store uh, last week. So yes, there are definitely projects that are uh, still going right now. Some are that are just getting started right now. Um, Of course, you have to weigh each project on its own and see whether it makes sense to do that, uh, whether there's the, st- the uh, staff available and the uh, person power available in your community. But yeah, there's great, great projects happening right now. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add one thought on the two to three year planning question. Um, and then I'm going to ask maybe uh, Don and Brittany to check in on that question about, is there a message you would leave for the board members? Because there is a mix of participants today. Um, and Brian, I have there's conversation- one more question that just popped up about planning for a recession. I think it'd be good just to have 30 seconds on. Okay. Um, did my work, I mean, I was talking with a GM yesterday who said, we've got a strategic plan in place and obviously we've got to set it aside, but it's there. And whatever they're doing today still points in that direction. Don, take a shot at the recession question. I, I just wanted to say, yes, I think we should be planning for a recession. I think we need to be thinking in terms of all the different variables that we're putting in. If you look at the unemployment levels today, the numbers of businesses that are not operating, you should definitely be thinking, okay, what happened in uh, 2009, 2010? What can I draw from that? And how do I build on that? Awesome. All right, Brittany, I'm going to give you the last word if you'd like it. Um, in that question saying, you know, we've got a mix of board members and operators mm-hmm. in the room. Is there a message for boards that you would convey about what they can do to be most supportive in this situation around the financials? Yeah, I think the the message for, you know, the the GMs and the boards is really similar. Everyone wants to know what's the balance between freezing and hunkering down in place and figuring out what the future looks like. Um, I really liked Ben's response to the two to three year planning question because uh, there is a need to think about the future. We're not just waiting for things like a light to switch and things to go back to the way they were. So I'm not an economist, but I agree with Don that I think recession is coming. So I think um, the the key is for your co-op to find the appropriate balance of what security and sustainability in your operation today looks like. Get really good data. So you're making data-driven decisions about what tomorrow looks like. So there is going to be a future. It's going to be bright. Our co-ops are going to be resilient. And it's just a matter of putting the intention into the planning and um, planning and monitoring our plans at at a much more frequent rate than we're really used to doing for maybe the next year or so until things begin to level out a little bit. Awesome. 
All right, I'm going to I'm going to honor our commitment to have you guys um, be able to sign off in an hour here. I want to thank Brittany and Don and Ben um, and again I just want to say thank you for you know for for being here and for uh, participating. I wish we had a chance to talk to everybody and have you all contribute, you know, um, you know comments also but th- obviously we're making adaptations for the technology. Brittany, Don, Ben, any last thoughts? Thank Just you thank all so much. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Go co-op. Go co-op. Awesome. Hey, thanks a lot, everybody. Mm-hmm.